Soundington Media. What animals are you afraid of? Maybe spiders or sharks? Or maybe you get worried about large dogs or certain kinds of creepy crawlies. As we mention a lot on this show, fear is a very normal human response meant to keep us safe. Our brains have evolved over thousands of years to use fear to activate a series of chemical processes that help us avoid or get away from danger. Fear can trigger the release of adrenaline, which would power our bodies to run away without feeling tired or slow, as we might in a non-dangerous situation. For many of us, a fear of a particular animal might be related to a particular experience. I was very young when I saw the shark movie Jaws, and even when I found out that sharks did not get as big as the ones in the movie, and that most sharks are not dangerous to people, I still found myself thinking about them every time I went in the water. That experience shaped my thinking. But what about when we're afraid of something that isn't real? or doesn't have a basis in lived experience. Would it surprise you if I told you that one of the most widely recognized creatures in fantasy culture might actually have its origins in humans' instinctual fear of real animals? I'm Elise Parisian, and we'll be talking about everything to do with dragons on this episode of Unspookable. A dragon is a mythical creature that kind of reminds me of dinosaurs if they had scales and had more colors, like multiple colors. A dragon is a four-legged creature that has wings and blows fire. A dragon is a flying mythical creature that is usually big, can breathe fire, and also lays eggs. A dragon reminds me of an alligator or a turtle or maybe some sort of fish, like an angelfish, if it had wings and it got a lot bigger. I think the closest living animal to dragons, I would say, would probably be, um, like a turkey or something? Probably, like snakes and like bearded dragons and like lots of reptiles. The reason I picked turkeys is because they are relatives to dinosaurs and dinosaurs look like dragons. Try to think of the last time you saw an image of a dragon or read about one. Did it take you long? For younger people, maybe you've read the book Dragons Love Tacos or the Aragon series. Or you remember the dragons in Harry Potter. Maybe you've seen How to Train Your Dragon or Pete's Dragon. For older people, maybe you've read The Hobbit or seen Game of Thrones or The Witcher. It seems wherever you look, there are all kinds of stories for people of all ages that involve dragons. And although some of the examples I just gave might be more familiar to people in English-speaking countries, people all over the world have versions of dragon myths From New Zealand to Norway to India to Alaska, pretty much everywhere there is human life, there are dragon stories. Even before we were connected by modern technology, people all over the world came up with similar ideas about what a dragon is and what it does. So what are those ideas? Well, maybe first we should ask, what does a dragon look like to you? Can you imagine it? Does it have scales, wings, smoky nostrils? Can it breathe fire? Have sharp teeth and claws? A long body like a big lizard or snake? Though dragon imagery differs over time and between cultures, for the most part, lots of those descriptors hold true across the world. The first examples of dragon imagery come to us from the Egyptians and from people around ancient Mesopotamia, located in present-day Iran and Iraq. A seal found in the ruins of the ancient city Susa in present-day Iran dates back to 3000 BC. It shows a dragon that's kind of a mixture of a lion and an eagle. An ancient Sumerian hymn from around 2500 BC tells of the sun god Ninurta 
A large, scaled creature with front teeth like a lion and back feet like an eagle. Babylonian art from around 600 BC shows the Sirish, a fierce, biting creature that served Tiamat, the mother of the gods. The Sirish looked like part bird, part snake, part lion, and part scorpion. An Egyptian hieroglyph from around 1300 BC in the temple of Seti I shows a snake-like creature with wings, clawed feet, and three heads. Let's take a moment to look at some similarities between these dragons and creatures we've talked about before. Did you listen to Unspookable's episode on mermaids? You might recognize some similar themes in that episode. In the places where we have early records of human civilization, in some cases from over 5,000 years ago, those places all developed dragon imagery, just like they developed mermaid imagery. Even though the ways the dragons or mermaids look might differ slightly, it's clear that humans have some connection to these ideas, whether or not they were inspired by real sightings. It's like somewhere in the human imagination, we all have these pictures, even if we can't explain where they come from. In the case of early dragons, just like early mermaids, it seems that part of the imagination comes from fear and respect. A lot of these dragons were symbols of power, either gods or kings, who, at the time, were often believed to be related to gods. It's almost as if the power of the dragon came from its in-betweenness. Not a bird or a reptile or a mammal, but having characteristics of all three. More on the human imagination and dragons, right after this. I don't believe dragons ever existed because... I don't think there's an actual animal ever that can breathe fire. I think that they could have existed because there were dinosaurs back then, and it's kind of like a pterodactyl, but like a giant dinosaur with pterodactyl wings. I do believe dragons used to exist because, they, yes, they could have existed, and we could not have known it. If I saw a dragon, I'd probably hide because I don't know if the dragon was trying to kill me or if it was hurt. If I saw a dragon, I would follow it um, to its nest, if it had a nest, take one of its eggs so I can have a pet dragon. Around the year 300 AD, a historian named Chang Ku published what is believed to be the first written account of the discovery of dinosaur fossils uncovered in Wuchang, in what is now the Sichuan province in southwestern China. But do you know what Chang Ku called the discovery? Dragon bones. After all, if you didn't know that dinosaurs had once existed, what would you imagine was the source of, say, a fossilized stegosaurus, which may have been around 30 feet long, 15 feet tall, and had armored plates and spikes? To a lot of people, Chang Ku's writings would have made a lot of sense. Dragons are very popular in Chinese mythology. In writings as early as 2700 BC, dragons are described as large creatures with snake bodies, claws, and mouths full of teeth. Chinese dragons frequently feature spines or crests coming out from their backs, and although they can fly, they're often shown without wings. The Chinese word for dragon, long, is believed by some scholars to be derived from an onomatopoeia of the sound of thunder, a fearsome image without a doubt, but one not too far away from the image the dinosaur was given. The Greek root words that dinosaur comes from are danos, meaning fearfully great, and soros, meaning lizard. One of the scholarly explanations for the human preoccupation with dragons comes from exactly the conundrum that Chang Ku ran into. When people began discovering dinosaur fossils with no known daily life creatures to compare them to, what else were they supposed to think they were than the stuff of their stories and legends? Many areas of China are now known as hotspots for dinosaur fossil collection. In Lufeng, in the Yunnan province alone, there have been 110 fossils in 24 families and 34 species unearthed. Could the discovery of dinosaur fossils in different corners of the earth have led to humans believing in dragons? Maybe. But what about the creatures that are alive now? alongside humans. Could those offer an explanation? Think of the largest animals you've ever seen. 
either in real life or in pictures. What are some that come to mind? Beyond just dinosaur fossils, what if you encountered, say, a whale skeleton on a beach when you had never seen a live whale? Could you imagine that creature could fly? Some historians have also guessed that human exposure to creatures such as the Nile crocodile in sub-Saharan Africa could be an inspiration for dragon-type creatures. As the largest crocodile species, some can grow upwards of 18 feet long. And unlike other types, the Nile crocodile doesn't just crawl along on its belly. It's capable of what's called a high walk, which might make it look even more like a dragon. In some corners of South America, southeastern Asia, and India, both giant anacondas and reticulated pythons can weigh hundreds of pounds and grow anywhere from 15 to 30 feet long. Could it be that thousands of years ago, the first humans, who were far smaller than we are today, could have encountered these giant animals and woven those memories into fantastical tales of dragons? But how would live interaction between very specific groups of people and animals, or fossils, in very specific areas of the world account for the fact that nearly every culture, no matter the climate or language or customs, talks about dragons? They're called smok in Polish, tatsu in Japanese, terracona in Maori, and uktena in Cherokee, just to name a few. Is it possible that someone in New Zealand and someone in North America could come up with similar imagery if it was based on real animals that each group had interacted with? One intriguing theory has more to do with the evolution of the human brain over thousands of years than any encounters in conscious human memory. Many species of apes and monkeys have warning sounds that signal to each other when different types of danger appear, the same way that if we were playing near a street and someone yelled, car, we would be able to get a picture in our heads and know that we should pause our game and make sure everyone is in the safety of the sidewalk. A monkey might make a particular sound that indicates a particular predator. In his book, An Instinct for Dragons, David Jones mentions the calls of the ververt monkey, native to the southeastern countries of Africa. Researchers have observed ververts using different sounds to warn each other about snakes, leopards, and birds of prey. A snake sound would make the rest of the group look down, where the bird sound makes them look up, and the leopard sound makes them run to the delicate branches of the trees, where the leopard is too heavy to go. Jones suggests that these types of instinctual behaviors in our close primate relatives might give us a clue as to why humans all over the world invented dragons. As we have evolved from primates, perhaps we have taken that instinctual fear of these types of predators with us coated deep in our nervous systems. After all, if you mix the fiercest parts of a snake, a leopard, and a bird of prey, the parts that make them great predators, what do you get? Something that looks an awful lot like a dragon. Perhaps one of these explanations rings true for you, at least for the early history of dragons. But what about the seemingly infinite varieties of dragons in popular culture today? More on how the dragon became a modern fantasy fixture when we get back. Some dragons that I've heard of are Mushu from Mulan, and in Wings of Fire, most of the characters are dragons. Also, something about dragons. Dragons love tacos. It's a book, one of my favorite books. I've heard of dragons in... Harry Potter and Game of Thrones and How to Train a Dragon. There's more dragons in Shrek, Harry Potter, and How to Train Your Dragon. Dragons love tacos, but they do not like spicy tacos. In one ancient Greek myth, the hero Perseus rescues Andromeda from the sea monster Cetus. Chained to a rock in the ocean, as a sacrifice to the god Poseidon, Andromeda is a classic example of a damsel in distress. Have you heard that phrase before? In many early myths and quest stories through the Middle Ages, a popular plot point features a brave man going on a journey for fame and fortune, often featuring the rescue of a helpless woman, who may become his wife. Artists frequently depict the sea monster in Andromeda's story as dragon-like, an example of one of the first princess and dragon type stories. As storytelling progresses towards modern day, dragons remained physically intimidating, 
but they also began to develop emotional and intellectual characteristics that made them frightening in new ways. Dragons are described as greedy, possessive, manipulative, and cruel. They demand human sacrifices, hoard treasure, and claim entire towns as their own. They laze around in caves most of the time, deciding when to take to the skies and wreak havoc, often with fire breathing. In St. George and the Dragon, a well-known European dragon story originating around the 4th century, but believed to be written down for the first time in the 11th century, the knight George fights and slays a dragon that has taken up residence at a spring that provides water for a large city-state. In some versions, the dragon has the power to spew venom and is poisoning the water source. At first, the people of the city offer the dragon sheep, but then the dragon is no longer satisfied and they have to feed it people. Each time the dragon demands a sacrifice, straws are drawn. And one time, the lot falls to the king's daughter. The king tries to give away all his gold and silver to his people so they don't make his daughter go, but she must go anyway. Dressed as a bride, she goes to the spring where the dragon lives, only to meet St. George, who fights and kills the dragon and saves the princess. In many versions of the story, the princess isn't even given a name, even though she was brave enough to go face the dragon with no weapons or anything. George is still the hero of the story. Seems like this particular damsel wasn't even given a chance to save herself. As the centuries progress, the princess and the dragon theme is invented and reinvented into the 20th century, eventually leading to quintessential animation, like Disney's Sleeping Beauty where the prince rescues Aurora under a sleeping spell from the evil Maleficent, who turns into a dragon for the final battle. In J.R.L. Tolkien's novel, The Hobbit, the famous dragon Smog has taken over the dwarf kingdom Erebor for 150 years. Tolkien's inspirations for Smog, described as a specially greedy, strong, wicked worm, are believed to be the dragon from the 10th century story of Beowulf, and the dragon Fafnir in Norse mythology who could speak. The now famous dragons in Harry Potter represent a whole range of different types from different areas of the world. The Hungarian horntail in Harry Potter is terrifying, fast, and dangerous, where the series describes species like the common green dragon as more docile. Just like any other animal, dragons in modern storytelling have taken on a whole range of personalities and characteristics. It may be easier for us to dismiss a fear of dragons than it was for, say, our common ancestors 7,000 years ago. As modern humans, we like to think that we have a handle on real fears versus imaginary ones. So, we shouldn't be afraid of dragons, right? Well, maybe we have no need to worry about fire-breathing, smooth-talking, and treasure-hoarding dragons like Smog. But have you ever been to Indonesia? On several small islands north of Australia, the Komodo dragon, a type of monitor lizard, can grow up to 10 feet long and weigh 150 pounds. These dragons will eat almost anything that crosses their path, whether freshly killed or already dead, deer, birds, bugs, even each other. Komodos have been known to eat their enemies and their young. Their lower jaws have glands that secrete an anticoagulant, a toxin that prevents blood from clotting, and could make it so that prey die from otherwise non-fatal wounds. Seems like all that's missing on this dragon are the wings, right? Whether you've seen a Komodo or not, it seems the human imagination has quite a few reasons for coming up with dragon stories. After all, there must be some common thread that has led us, all over the world, to come up with new variations on the same type of creature for the last several thousand years. Maybe so many years later, the common thread is just simply our collective humanity. That buried deep instinct that, when a shadow crosses the sun, has us tell ourselves that's probably a cloud or an airplane, but we still look up. After all, what if it wasn't an airplane? What if it was something else? Thanks for listening to Unspookable. I'm your host, Elise Parisian. This episode was written by Eleanor Riley Condit, produced and edited by Nate Dufort. Our theme song and additional music composed by Jesse Case. Our logo was created by Natalie Kewen, with episode artwork by Brianna Jacoby. 
Special thanks this week to our guests Blythe, Olivia, and Al. If you enjoy the show, make sure to tell your friends. You can leave us a rating and review in your podcast player of choice, or share an episode on social media. Speaking of social media, you can find Unspoogable on Twitter and Instagram. Follow us for a peek behind the scenes and for updates on the show. Unspookable is part of the Soundsington Audio Network, committed to making quality programming for young audiences and the young at heart. For more information on our shows and the people behind them, go to www.soundsingtonmedia.com. <laughs>